back in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He discusses this matter uh, a little further. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 and 21. He said, Now is Christ raised from the dead and become the first fruits of those that sleep. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection from the dead. You know, evolution offers a materialistic explanation in which death is something that has simply always been. It's just part of the natural order of things, according to evolutionary theory. There was no Garden of Eden. There was no Adam and Eve. There was no serpent, and there was no first sin, according to Charles Darwin. But, my friends, if you can't believe Genesis 3 regarding the origin of sin and the current human condition, then what basis do you have to believe John 3 regarding God's solution to sin and death by the gift of His Son and our Savior, Jesus Christ? Frankly, evolution and the Bible simply are not compatible. Anyone who tells you that they believe in both evolution and the Bible simply show that they understand neither. Now, my friends... It is possible for you to really understand this subject. It's possible for you to prove the answers to yourself. Is there a real God? What is He like? What can you know about God and about God's plan? Is God simply a disinterested first cause? Or is He actively involved with His creation? I've got a free booklet here. Call now. Now, back to our topic, my friends. You know, anybody can invent a theory. But where is the evidence to prove or disprove that theory? Can we see evolution currently taking place? Can it be replicated in the laboratory? You know, if man and the creatures that currently inhabit our world have gradually evolved over many millions of years from a one-cell life form, then surely there should be fossil evidence of transitional species. After all, if changes occurred gradually and nature selected only the most efficient while others died out, then the transitional species should far outnumber those with which we are familiar. You know, evolutionists want so badly to find evidence to support their theory that they're often quite gullible and credulous. One example is an article published in the November 1999 National Geographic magazine. This article trumpeted the headline, quote, New bird-like fossils are missing links in dinosaur evolution, end quote. Now, they had pictures of a reconstructed uh, bird-like dinosaur. They had a picture of fossil remains. And underneath the picture of the fossil remains, there was a caption that proclaimed, quote, This creature, found in Liaoning Province, China, is a true missing link in the complex chain that connects dinosaurs to birds, end quote. This fossil, called a transitional species and named Archaeoraptor by scientists, was displayed in the latter part of 1999 at the National Geographic Society headquarters in Washington, D.C. Then came the rest of the story. You see, a few months later, in the February 14, 2000 issue of U.S. News and World Report magazine, well, frankly, the editors of U.S. News and World Report just couldn't resist taunting their now embarrassed counterparts at National Geographic. They did so with an article that they entitled, The Piltdown Chicken. You see, it seems that the scientists hadn't really found the missing link between birds and dinosaurs after all. Quoting from U.S. News, quote, Now paleontologists are eating crow. Instead of a true missing link connecting dinosaurs to birds, the specimen appears to be a composite. It's unusual appendage likely tacked on by a Chinese farmer, not evolution. The very bad news 
delivered to the Society December 20th in an email from Chinese paleontologist and co-researcher Su Qing has rekindled debate over the origin of birds, end quote. My friends, have you ever walked into a museum of natural history and looked around at the displays? You know, when you walk into such a mu museum and you look at the various uh, things that they have on display, you would be inclined to think that the fossil record reve reveals much about the transition from one species to another. You know, viewing lifelike recreations of the simian appearing ancestors of modern man the average person would be amazed to know upon how little evidence such reconstructions are commonly made. You know, sometimes the conclusions of evolutionists are such that you almost have to wonder if they can really be serious. Now, take this statement that came from National Geographic magazine, an article, uh, Was Darwin Wrong?, that was covered in the November 2004 issue. Now, this particular uh, quote regarded the discovery that was made by a paleontologist, Philip Gingrich. Uh, he spent years researching the ancestry of whales. Quote, in the year 2000, Gingrich chose a new field site in Pakistan where one of his students found a single piece of fossil that changed the prevailing view in paleontology. It was half of a pulley-shaped ankle bone, known as an astragalus. Suddenly, he realized how closely whales are related to antelopes. This is how science is supposed to work. Ideas come and go, but the fittest survive. Downstairs in his office, Bill Gingrich opened a specimen drawer, showing me some of the actual fossils from which the display skeletons upstairs were modeled. He put a small lump of petrified bone, no larger than a lug nut, into my hand. It was the famous astragalus from the species he had eventually named Arteocletus clavis, end quote. Proving the connection between whales and antelopes from something the size of a lug nut? Look at that, my friends. If you looked at something that size, would it suddenly dawn on you that whales and antelopes are very much alike? You know, let's get real. You know, if you really want to know uh, why the fossil record is so empty of transitional species, the answer is found right in your Bible. All you have to do is just go right back to Genesis chapter 1. In Genesis chapter 1, uh, we'll uh, note here uh, that, uh, uh, here in verse 21, and God created great whales. That's where the whales came from. God created great whales and every living creature that moves, which the waters brought forth abundantly after their kind, and every winged fowl after his kind. And God saw that it was good. God made the animals after their kind. That's why there's no transitional species, my friends. That's why that 99, 999 out of every thousand of what the evolutionists expect to find isn't there. That's because it never was there. God made these creatures to reproduce after their kind. Now, aside from the fossil record which even the evolutionists admit that 999 out of every 1,000 items that they're looking for are missing. Where is the evidence touted by the evolutionary scientists to prove Darwin's theory? Well, what they point to is variation within a single species. For instance, pigeons vary in size and color. On his trip to the Galapagos Islands, Darwin collected small brownish birds. They had variations in the size and shape of their beaks. This pattern of diversification 